Jerry, it is so good to, to hear from you, man. Uh, how's everything going today? What are you up to, man? Uh, I just got back from Bora Bora as of uh, yesterday. That's wow. A nice little summer vacation, or I'm assuming you were yeah. working in some capacity, or, or was that more for no, pleasure? I was on vacation. I had been working up in uh, Vancouver since uh, early April on a project, and uh, I finished working on that and got a couple of weeks off, and I have to head back up on Sunday to finish the editing part of it. Uh, we shot 40 days on a project called Hit the Road, uh, which is a uh, half-hour single-camera musical comedy starring Jason Alexander. Um, I directed the pilot, and I directed all 10 episodes that followed, so it was a pretty big undertaking. Absolutely, and I, I saw you were involved um, in another thing called uh, The Optimist, which is in pre-production right now. Kind of what's uh, the status of that? There wasn't a lot of information about it. What can you tell us about uh, The Optimist? Well, The Optimist has been a project that is near and dear to the heart that we've been working on for uh, several years now. It's difficult uh, to get uh, a feature, independent feature film set up these days to be able to do it you know, uh, in a way that you want to feel comfortable doing it. Uh, with enough financing to be able to produce it properly. It's a story of a, um, of a young girl, uh, 13 years old, whose mother is, uh, is being incarcerated uh, for uh, opioids, uh, and, and um, she uh, uh, is, is, wants her mother defended, believes her mother's innocent, uh, is, is a very optimistic young girl, and uh, gets the attorney to uh, represent her and try to make a deal and get her out. But it's, it's a, there's humor in it. There's a lot of drama in it as well. And um, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, uh, interesting story. Um, small movie, not a big movie, not a lot of action in it. And, um, you know, uh, we're, we're excited. We've got, uh, we've got some people that are backing it and uh, that want to produce it, and we're in the process of uh, trying to cast it right now, uh, which, you know, a lot of uh, green lights are contingent upon, you know, who you get to be in the film. So we're in the process right now uh, of uh, working on that. Well, at this stage of your career, Jerry, and I mean, you've done, uh, fr from acting to directing, what, kind of what uh, do you look for when uh, when you when you get engaged in a project? Is it kind of one of those deals where you a lot of things cross your path and you just sort of pick and choose? What at this stage of your career, like what excites you about about filmmaking and what kind of projects are, are you kind of looking to get involved in? You talk about the independent side of things, and is that kind of more your passion as opposed to kind of getting on board with these you know bigger Hollywood productions that seem to be more interested in superheroes and I don't even know what all else these days? But you get the drift. Yeah, I, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm I'm in the position where I'm able to, you know, uh, be more selective about the projects that I want to do. You know, when I was younger, I was it was it was a little bit different, and and um, there's never been anything that I've done that I haven't felt very good about. Um, but as, as you know, um, the industry has changed dramatically uh, from from what it used to be, and feature films are very different now than they were uh, in the past. Uh, to get a, a, a independent film made, you need to have uh, a lot of pieces of the puzzle in place. It's more about um, international financing than it is about producing a movie because there are no more ancillary markets to go to necessarily to, to find money to, to, to make your movie. You're not selling DVDs. You're not, you're not making uh, you know, movie deals for them. You're not making any of these other kinds of deals. Um, so what happens is it seems to me that um, it needs to fit a formula in the international market to be able to get pre-sales uh, uh, on an actor's name, on a script, on a genre, uh, and then be able to uh, pre-sell it and get the money to finance it. So it's a, it's, it's, a different, it's a different formula that's being followed, a different business model um, than, than people just throwing money down and going ahead and making a film and hoping that good things happen with it. So uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, you know, working um, as, a, as a director, I'm trying to self-generate projects of my own. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so far, so good, you know, but they take a long time to get done. In the meantime, in the interim, what I do is I, I, I work on other projects. What I've wanted to do um, as, of, as of recently with my career was contemporize it in a way that in, you know, instead of directing a lot of broadcast television uh, work, which there seems to be a reasonable amount, there seems to be a, a plethora of, of places of distributors to, to, uh, uh, to do.
do other things like this project that I just finished and I'm currently uh, in post-production on was financed by um, AT&T, Primary Wave, Fabric, and these are three companies, and it's going to Direct TV, which is the distributor. Um, so uh, in a sense, um, you work on contemporizing yourself because you're able to do material that that is a little bit more irreverent and a little bit more, uh, uh, well, quite frankly, a lot more irreverent than yeah. what you're able to do on broadcast. And that seems to be what folks are, are wanting to watch more of now, you know. Uh, as, you, as I'm sure you're well aware, they're going to Amazon and Hulu and Netflix mm-hmm. and DirecTV and, and, and all of these, you know, uh, different different um, distributors. And it gives you a lot more creative freedom. So, actually, that's something that I was able to just, just accomplish, um, which was a goal of mine as a director, uh, to do that. Um, and so, I just completed that, and I think that... Um, you know, we've got our fingers crossed. We think there will be more. Um, and Jason Alexander was a dream to work with and hilarious. Um, so uh, we had a really great time doing that. Um, I'm following it up uh, with, uh, when I finish that, I should get done with that by the end of September. I've been asked to uh, re- go back on Will and Grace, where I was a, a recurring character. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Joe and Larry will be back to Will and Grace. Uh, we've already booked our time. For that, I have, um, <clears throat> I was, I'm scheduled to direct multiple episodes of Hawaii Five O, which uh, is something that I've been doing uh, for the past, uh, since their second season. So um, I'm, I'm keeping pretty busy, and I've got more work lined up, uh, you know, with Hit the Road, probably. Uh, that's the name of the, uh, the project I'm doing for Direct TV. And um, hopefully we'll get a pick up on that and we'll get get rolling on that. And The Optimist is something that um, we're, in the, we're in the process of casting. And the minute we get the right the right person in the right place, um, we'll, we'll be ready to roll on that one as well. Yeah, well, all so. the best with that. And, uh, Jerry, I just want to kind of get into what did you learn about directing, kind of going uh, up through the process, uh, being an actor, uh, kind of going up through the ranks, uh, especially from films like uh, The Ghost of Mississippi being directed by Rob Reiner, and then Born on the Fourth of July being directed by Oliver Stone. Well, I, I was very fortunate to work with, um, you know, some extraordinary directors, uh, which included uh, Rob and, and Oliver and, um, you know, uh, uh, Barry Levinson and, and, and different iconic directors. I was always a director. It was. It wasn't as if you know. It, it just started. I spent my entire lifetime uh, working in entertainment. I have a BFA in acting from Boston University, which is uh, where I got my degree, uh, and that goes back to you know when I was 18 years old. Prior to that, uh, I've been working um, as well. So there's there's never been a time where I, where I haven't been directing. As an actor in the feature films that I've done, I've been very fortunate to work with these these ma- major directors, and you know all of the movies that that I have made have actually come out <laughs> and, and <laughs> been seen by the public. Um, so, what did I learn? You know, I think the best acting class I ever had was directing, and I think the best directing class I ever had was um, acting. Um, they inform each other in a way that that uh, is invaluable to you uh, on both both sides of the camera. You sit behind a monitor long enough watching actors perform, you learn a lot. Uh, if you Once you get in front of the camera and you're, you're acting, uh, you learn a lot about what's, what, what your needs are as an actor, which, which informed what I was able to do as a director. So um, I usually get along very well with actors because I'm, my orientation to the material is through acting uh, and 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 so one thing informs the other uh, i once got some very good advice from a very smart person uh who said that it was wise to diversify within your field meaning write produce direct act you know and and stay in the arena that you that you know because one thing informs the other you know if, if, if you're a director of photography, you learn a lot about, you know, aspects of directing. If, if 
if you're an actor, you learn about aspects of acting, which help the directing and, and vice versa. So um, working with Rob and working with Oliver and working with Barry and, and working with uh, uh, Ivan Reitman and, and some of these iconic uh, uh, named directors, they all come at it from a very different perspective, very different point of view. Rob was an actor, so he, 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 he knew it, how to do that. Oliver Stone being a writer, uh, you know, he, he approached it very differently. His directing style was different. Um, so, you know, you, you, you learn something from, from all of them. You know, watching the great Jimmy Burroughs, uh, who directed every episode of Will and Grace that there was, you know, really informed the way I direct uh, comedy and the way we play comedy. So, um, you know, I've learned from all of them various different things, both good and, and, and bad at the same time. Oliver was more of a director who directed uh, uh, off camera than he did on camera, you know, and uh, he directed the person, <laughs> not necessarily sure. the character. Yeah. Well, and, and, and Jerry, you know, your your um, debut film, of course, was in 1985. It was Teen Wolf, going back to your acting career a little bit. Um, kind of unbelievable just um, that time period uh, coming into that, um, obviously with Michael J. Fox. He was uh, really big at the time as well. But just kind of talk about the process. I know you'd done, I think, some uh, some TV and you said you'd worked quite a bit before that. But uh, your first feature film, it's Teen Wolf. How did that process happen for you? How did you uh, wind up a, as a part of that film? Which it's funny, it's gone down in the American lexicon as such a such a classic 80s film for whatever reason. And Styles. There's just something about Styles that uh, that everybody loves, everybody knows. One of the great comedic characters, I think, maybe uh, maybe of uh, the entire decade. So you always have that, and I know you always uh, speak very highly of um, the role you played with Styles. Well, well, that was that was really an extraordinary uh, time in in my life, as well as uh, a different time in in movies. I had uh, I was doing um, the stage stage work in New York City. Uh, uh, prior to coming to California, I was cast. I played um, Cousin Elliot on a television series called Charles in Charge, which I know you guys are familiar of with. Of course, yes. yes. And um, I was brought out to California to uh, play a recurring character on that television series. And I had been, uh, you know, primarily a stage actor uh, 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 prior to that. And when I got out to California, um, I, was, I auditioned for this movie, Teen Wolf. And um, certainly uh, didn't know what I was doing at the time, <laughs> um, and got the part, and, and 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 it worked out well with Michael. Um, I was just pretty much, um, you know, playing a free spirited game with that with that part, and it has become. Uh, I, I do believe I know the way my obituary will will read, regardless of uh, whatever work I do from this point or any point on, whether it's been nominated for the Academy Award or not, um, it will always read Jerry Levine, best known as Styles from Teen Wolf, um, which, which I think is, is great. You know, it takes it takes you time to to get used to it a little bit. Uh, at first, you know, it's, it's overwhelming where you're so identified with one particular character that you want to do other things and you want to, uh, uh, you know, be known for a, a larger body of work. Um, but after a while, you come to realize that it is such a gift and a blessing to to have at least one character that you've played that is iconic in a way um, that that has reaches everywhere in the world. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not um, uh, talking about Teen Wolf to somebody, some fan or or or, or anybody for that matter. And it seems that when you turn 10 years old, it's mandatory mandatory that you watch that movie. <laughs> um, yes, and I think it just—I think it just—it it, it hit a, um, a special chord uh, uh, with with the zeitgeist of, of the world. Um, it was a small movie. It was a nice movie. It was a—it was a movie that you could relate to, and um, it, it, the characters were interesting. Um, the, the, as far as playing Styles was concerned, I remember there was a there was an athlete. In the NFL, who changed his name to Styles uh, uh, as a result of, of Team Wolf, and ESPN had called and asked to talk to me about it to see, you know, what my feelings were. 
And and I, I thought, well, you know, that's kind of wild that someone wants to change the name to a character I play. And I and I had to, since it was an ESPN interview, I thought I would do a think a think of some sort of sports analogy to describe the way I I approached that that performance playing that character. And and it reminds me of when they interview an athlete after a a game, uh, you know, and it's. There were three seconds left on the clock, and 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 you scored the winning basket. And you know what were you thinking? And the answer usually is, I wasn't thinking. I was I was just in a zone, and I brought the ball down court, threw it at the hole, it went in, and we won the game. And and that kind of feels what <clears throat> Styles was like to me. I I was so free spirited at the time, and so naive about uh, you know the film industry that I just went down there and, and tried to rock it out this character and he took over. Uh, he took he took me over <laughs> and 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 it just sort of went from there, very free spirited, very just brought the ball down court, threw it at the hole and it seemed to have uh, you know, gone in and hit the right uh, chord. Of course that movie script was uh, you know, is is a classic in its storytelling. And, um, you know, it's about a kid who, who, who just wants to be like everybody else. And, 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 and of course, then gets powers that he's got to learn to control. So um, I think it, it has a, 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 um, a universal theme that, that, that lasts. And, and I'm thrilled to have played Styles. I, I, uh, I, I really, really enjoy um, the way people respond to that character now much more so than I did, you know, 10 years after the movie was released. But at this point, I'm, I'm, it's a blessing to have it. Well, what was your experience like on that film, working with Michael J. Fox, also uh, another great actor, James Hampton? I know you had a lot of scenes with. And also, uh, where did those colorful shirts come about? Uh, what are you looking at, Dick Nose? One of my personal favorites. Yeah, that, that's pretty funny. <laughs> you know, with, every time I'm sure you speak to somebody, nobody really has any idea. You know, I knew that when we were doing Born on the Fourth of July, that was going to be something. I, I, I knew that when I read that script, it would be something. Um, uh, I felt it would be special. Um, we, we didn't know what to think about, um, you know, working on Teen Wolf. At the time, uh, Michael was uh, in, in um, Family Ties, which was a very successful television series. And in the evenings, he was going to do, he replaced Eric Stoltz in Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. So he was shooting Back to the Future in the evening, and we were shooting Teen Wolf during the day. He was an absolute delight to work with. I think he was, you know, it was very overwhelming for him to be, you know, torn apart by wild beasts as he was working. Uh, <laughs> you know, because he was working at night uh, for Robert Zemeckis and for us during the day. And he was still, you know, involved in family ties. He's a tremendous human being, Michael J. Fox. Um, very giving, very thoughtful, great actor. Um, and and we were all, it was his first, one of his first feature films also. So we were all in the same, in the same boat, you know, you know, trying to uh, make this movie. And it was a little movie and, and we didn't really know necessarily what we were doing. We, we had no idea. It was led by Rod Daniel, uh, who has recently passed away. Uh, but he was he was the most he was an extraordinarily energetic director who just knew what this movie was about, knew what story he wanted to tell, and um, we just followed his lead. and And Michael was uh, was just a pleasure and a, and a joy to be around all the time. Funny, helpful, uh, and as as a person. You know, when I got to know him a little bit, um, just a, a really great guy. And I think we were all in the right place at the right time. The stars just sort of aligned for us. And then they released Back to the Future and Teen Wolf within a week of each other. And it was Michael that, uh, you know, was the attraction. But ultimately, in the end, I, 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 I think it's funny. I was speaking with Jeff Loeb, who... Uh, is is the writer because we were going to remake the film i was going to direct it and jeff was going to write it and this was uh when um this was when uh, uh and 
uh, MTV was negotiating with MGM or whoever it was to do the television series. So they didn't, one hand didn't know what the other was doing at the time. And we would have, I said, I think if you released Teen Wolf today as a movie, um, it would be extremely successful. So Jeff and I were going to do it. Um, but the point is, um, one thing that he had said to me about uh, watching the movie in the theater when he knew it was going to work was when the scene where Jimmy Hampton uh, is knocking on the bathroom door and Michael is in, in the bathroom turning into a werewolf. And his, he's knocking on the door and he's saying, son, I know what you're going through. And the son says, I don't think so, Dad. <laughs> and um, it was it was Jeff Loeb who said to me that he knew the movie worked when I swung that door open and the audience exploded and there was Jimmy Hampton uh, standing there as a werewolf uh, and the audience exploded. And it's at that point that the tires took the road on in the movie theater itself when we knew that, uh, you know, we had something there and that it was going to work. Jimmy was was the most experienced one of, of everyone, and I don't know if you guys remember a series called F Troop. Yeah, I, I do remember that. And I, he was also on Full House around then as well, I believe. Yeah, I just loved oh. Jimmy. Jimmy is just amazing. Like, what a great guy. He's a sling blade. Yeah. He's done so much. Great guy. I was first introduced to him as a young, young kid watching this series called F Troop, which was really very funny. And of course, Sling Blade is just, you know, there's Sling Blade, there's the China Syndrome. James Hampton was, you know, a very well known uh, actor at the time and still is. Uh, so it was, you know, there I was. I still, I still get that, that thrill when I, you know, I just finished directing Richard Dreyfus. Uh, who guest starred on, on uh, Hit the Road. And and then I was directing Meatloaf, uh, who wow. came on and did it. You know, so I, I still get a, I still get a, quite a, a jolt when, when I'm working with another iconic actor, whether it be Cal Burnett or Frankie Valli or, you know, um, uh, Richard Dreyfuss or any of these, you know, iconic superstars that uh, continue to cross my path. Uh, mostly as a director at this point. Um, and uh, it, it still rings my bell. And Absolutely, and that's what it's all about. I think um, just in this business as, an, as a director, as an actor, it's things that, uh, that, that you get off on. I think that's so important. But, um, you know, one last thing about Teen Wolf, and I may be overanalyzing things because that's just kind of what I do in, in life and in entertainment. The, to me, the character of Styles um, kind of kind of has an arc, kind of has a, kind of evolves because you kind of overshadow uh, Michael J. Fox in the first you know few reels of the film. I mean, you're the over the top one. You host the party. You're on top of the van. You're and he's the one that's sort of looking for acceptance, looking for uh, you know to to be more popular. Uh, and then it's almost like Styles kind of starts to exploit. Michael J. Fox starts exploiting the wolf, starts selling T-shirts, and he doesn't want him to to be himself. And and it, but then at the end, it's almost like Styles comes full full around. I don't know. It's just kind of interesting to look at that character, and he does sort of evolve to me from the beginning to the end. Do you see it that way at all? Yeah, I certainly did. You know, being a classically trained actor, you know, looking for you know the evolution of a character and the arc of a character, and you know, a, approaching it all the same way, whether it's a, a you know a silly teen comedy or whether it's King Lear, you know, you still approach the character um, the same way. Um, Styles was a very powerful uh, force in that movie because he was, in a sense, you know, uh, setting up the conflict. Um, certainly, you know, people could break down Teen Wolf and, and, and be wise to break down Teen Wolf the way you are. <laughs> because it worked, and there's a reason why it worked, and, and you want to know why it worked. Um, Styles was a driving force in the movie because he he was continuing to push his best friend into doing something that that his best friend was conflicted about. You know, he was re reluctant at times uh, to to turn into the wolf, and it was Styles who said, "Wait a minute, you know, <clears throat> this is this is our key to being popular. This is our key to to to." know everything that we, that we wanted to be you know we, never did we realize that we would be analyzing teen wolf from an academic point of view which we are. i'm just glad we are which we are but, but like i said it, it makes sense to do it because 
uh, it's such a successful film that you want to you want to analyze it, you want to look at it, you want to understand what what it is about it that that's made it last and 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 be, have the longevity that it does. So what what Styles does in, is is he he continues to push that 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 trend, you know, into doing something to to that he's reluctant to do, and it helps set up the conflict. Those T-shirts were absolutely crazy. I directed uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and um, Rob McElherney, Henny, uh, who, who created the series, came to me one day and said, "We would like, I would like to wear the What Are You Looking At Dick Nose T-shirt. <laughs> um, I, I said, fine, as long as you cut off the sleeves, because you're still playing Mac, and, and, and you got you to gotta show those guns. And, 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 and I've looked at things every once in a while I someone just sent me a picture of, of me playing styles with um, life sucks and then you die yes what, what are you looking at dick nose <laughs> um, you know I, had I known that the, that 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 these t-shirts and the colorful pants are, were gonna end up you know in the Smithsonian one day I would have kept them <laughs> uh, but uh, the T-shirts, all of those, all of the memorabilia and all the stuff, I remember giving them to my nieces and my nephews. And I mean, can you imagine if, you know, what it would be if I had a one of those T-shirts that I was selling? I don't know where they are. I, I know my nieces, I gave them to them. <laughs> uh, and people still remember the colored pants that I wear. There was red, there was green, there was, there was, there was, he was just a stylistic dude. He really was. It was... Reminds me a little bit of what happened, you know, with Sean Penn uh, as Spicoli in Fast Times at Richmond High. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, these guys just jump out at you, and and um, yeah, you know, Michael was, you know, not the straight man in Teen Wolf, but um, it, it was it was just a perfect setup to have this friend who 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 was so energetic and so excited about the prospects of what could happen. But the, the ironic thing was Styles was in it for himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is, absolutely. I guess the real question is, who has the Wolfmobile? That'd be the real relic if you'd, if you'd had that all these years. <laughs> that Wolfmobile, yeah. There are funny stories that go along with that Wolfmobile. That was, that was an old bread truck that, you know, gears would stick. And, you know, I did drive that truck. And, um, you know, I did it with a stuntman on top doing the backflips, and uh, Michael did drive his father's hardware van while I was on top doing the <laughs> surfing. Not dangerous um, at all. No. <laughs> yeah. The, the only stunt work that happened on that was, was a wolf on top doing backflips and things like that while I was driving. Um, you know, so uh, it, it would be great to have that mobile again i've seen i've seen a replica of it it's been pictures of it have been sent to me there was some guy doing some urban surfing uh yes. you know on a wolf mobile <laughs> and they sent me a picture and every once in a while i'll have to stand up on top of a van or something like that while i'm directing and boy when i get up there the cameras start going people start taking pictures. <laughs> He's at it again, folks. <laughs> Just need the Hawaiian yeah. shirt and the and the uh, the shades. I think were my favorite part of that because it's like those sunglasses in the '80s that weren't really sunglasses. They were just kind of plastic, and they just had the little ridges on them. They were neon colors. I love. <laughs> I just yeah, guys. I, I was out of my mind. I was, <laughs> I, was, I was completely out of my mind when I was playing that role. Uh, you know, things like pulling up and and doing a, a front roll onto a car, picking up a keg of beer falling out of the car with the keg of beer, you know, in the party. What people don't know about the party, why, why I was able to get such a groove on, was because there was so much shaving cream on the floor that when I moved, my legs were moving as if I was skating. <laughs> I was uh. not able to stand up straight <laughs> or, or walk because... By the time I, I, there was so much shaving cream and so much shit on the floor that 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 I was skating around and 
I'm telling you, I was I, I just brought the ball up court, down court, threw it at the hole, and it went in. You know, they'd come to me with different sunglasses and different shirts and different things, and I would just say, I'll wear this, I'll wear that, I'll wear this, I'll wear that. And, and I think it was one of those characters where you just really got to get out of the way of the actor um, and, and, and let it happen. I know Rod Daniel did do that. I would... I would look at him after takes and go, what do you think? And he'd be hysterical going, I don't know what to say. You know, I just keep going. Just keep doing what you're doing. And and he gave me so much freedom to be so out of my mind that um, that character emerged from just pure joy, pure innocence. I was very innocent at the time making that movie. It was my first movie. I had done some television work on Charles in Charge, but I was primarily a stage actor. So when I came out there, this was a this was um, I basically left it all on the field there. I on the court, I just blasted through that character, and you know didn't think about it too much, but did understand you know um, dramaturgically who that character was and what the function of the character was in the film. And I kept putting it to Michael and I kept putting it to him harder and harder every time, which which caused him to have to react in, in the manner in which he did. And, um, of course, it was Michael's presence that, uh, you know, got everybody to see the film. But once, once, once we got you in the movie theater, um, we had you. you. Look, the difference is <clears throat> when they asked me to make Teen Wolf 2, I was doing another movie with Andrew Dice Clay called uh, Casual Sex, and um, I, I I don't think I would have made Teen Wolf 2 anyway, um, because uh, you know you, you don't you don't want to necessarily go back to the same well again. You know I, I felt that I I, <coughs> I had done all there was to do with with Teen Wolf and Styles, and and it didn't make sense to. Um, revisit it, but just to give you an example, if we're talking about the mythology surrounding those two movies, Teen Wolf 2, um, I believe J Jason Bateman played him, and and I believe he was a boxer, which yeah. is a, it's a singular sport. It's not a it's not a team sport. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Teen Wolf, to, if you, you know to break down the mythology of it and the <clears throat> to take that academic approach to it, which Jeff and I were looking at when we were talking about redoing the movie, it, it feels as if it's it's important that um, it's a group sport. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a group sport that's played because if it's boxing, it's singular. It's just you as the boxer. If you're on a basketball team, then you've got teammates. And, and and you've got other people that you're responsible to. Um, and that, I think, is what made Teen Wolf, the original film, so successful. <clears throat> and, and maybe a little bit more successful, perhaps, than the sequel, simply because, it, it, you know, letting down his, his friends and, 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 and having other people affected by, you know, what it is that, that, that you, the choices that you make, and they were able to use the, the basketball team to make that happen. So that's a little bit of Teen Wolf mythology there. Yes, uh, Jerry. Now, for anyone who grew up in the '90s, uh, they would never forgive me if I didn't ask about your involvement in Boy Meets World. Uh, you uh, directed five episodes. You were in a great episode uh, called Cult Fiction, uh, alongside yeah. William Daniels, William Russ, Ben Savage, Ryder Strong. Uh, now, it looked like William Russ got a little physical with you there. He shoved you into the wall. I just want to make sure you're okay. He's been on the show before, yes. so. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Bill did uh, did uh, podcast with you guys. Um, it was fun. It was it was nothing no, nothing but a good time. William Russ is a great guy and a very talented actor and com in complete control of his instrument. So, again, I was playing a character who you know was the catalyst for things. That it's fun. It's 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 fun in the character who who uh, is. Causing some trouble. Who's who's making uh, 
decisions that affect everybody else. And it's the same thing that happened on uh, Charles in Charge. I played uh, Cousin Elliot. You familiar with Cousin Elliot? Yes, I love Charles in Charge. Definitely familiar. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I played... Um, oh, 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 you were back on Boy Meets World. I was thinking of Charles in Charge because it was a similar kind of thing. Um, yeah, no, Boy Meets World... Um, Again, it was a similar kind of thing. It was, um, you know, playing a, a, a cult leader that was creating a circumstance um, where there was conflict. So it's nice to be in the center of that hurricane. You know, you may not necessarily be the person who is receiving the hurricane, but it's nice to be the nucleus of the hurricane that's going to start the problem. And, 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 and that was... Uh, that was a fun character for me to play. As far as directing the show is, is concerned, it, it's uh, that was in that was a lot of fun. I also directed the episode where uh, Ben married Danielle. Uh, they got married, so I directed the married marriage episode, which was uh, was a, which was a, a special episode. That, however, <clears throat> is a sitcom. Directing a situation comedy is very different than directing a single camera film show. So they're 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 extraordinarily different. It's like doing a play. It's like going back on Will and Grace is going to be, you know, a return to the theater in a sense because it's multi camera, it's live, and you start the scene and you go to the end of the scene and everybody's coverage is being, you know, taken care of with the three or four cameras that are being used to, to shoot it. So. It's like doing a mini play. Um, and uh, so they're different. And, and that's, one, that's one area in my life where I've been fortunate. There's, not, there's nothing that I haven't done. There's no genre that I haven't worked in, whether it be film or television or theater, um, whether it's comedy or drama or satire or whatever it may be. I've been fortunate enough to, you know, have a career that, that has a larger body of work. But, you know, it's it's interesting. Some people get pigeonholed, and, and, and I, I attempted to not be pigeonholed, and it worked out for me. It, that's basically a, a double-edged sword, though. I mean, it's kept me working for my entire lifetime uh, to be able to not be pigeonholed into one particular ca uh, role, model, or, or area that I work in. But at the same time, you know, if you create, you know, a little niche for yourself where you, you know, play the same character all the time, you can become a superstar doing it. Um, so superstar may not be in my future, but what is in my future and what is in my past and my present is a, is a career that, that has longevity. It's a career that continues to be strong and, and, and to maintain itself. And it's, it's <laughs> it will probably... It will, uh, unless something crazy happens, I don't know how you're going to top styles, you know, <laughs> after 30 years. I, I just don't know how you're going to do that. I mean, the extraordinary thing is that people actually know the character's name. You know, it's not necessarily, they might not necessarily know my name, but they definitely know that I played style. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of people ask you about Tom Cruise, Kevin Spacey, but I'm going to go a little off script here. I'm going to ask you about Frank Whaley. A lot of people know him best as Archie Graham in Field of Dreams. Uh, you worked with him on Born on the Fourth of July. And then you, your next film was Swimming with the Sharks. You worked with him again. Was that a coincidence, or did he have something to do with that? And what was it like working with him? Well, it was all coincidence. I worked with Frank several times. The first time was on Born on the Fourth of July. We had a blast. We had an absolute blast together. Because he played Timmy, and um, I played Stevie Boyer. And we were, we were both... Tom Cruise's best friends in, uh, in that movie, although different, um, very different characters. His went to war, mine did not go to war, so we played very different characters. Um, Swimming with Sharks, that was a coincidence as well. Um, and I did another series with him called Buddy Farrow with Dennis Farina, which lasted about 13 episodes. So I worked with Frank three or four times. And I love Frank Whaley. He is the one of the funniest guys I know. Um, he is one of the most talented actors I know. You know, I mean, he can take a, he can steal Pulp Fiction from you if you're not careful. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yes, Brett. Yeah. He's 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 uh, he, he's just a 
really talented guy. He's a director as well. And, um, you know, I just loved working with Frank. When you, when you, you know, when you get off on these movie locations, you kind of connect with one or two people um, that you hang out with. Well, Frank and I hung out every day together and uh, I was born on the 4th of July. And, and uh, uh, you know, same thing with Swimming with Sharks. We were, we were buddies. So uh, that, that was, uh, I'd love to work with Frank again someday. Indeed, and I tell you what, Jerry, we've uh, we've we've already kept you too long. We were going to get into a uh, hour long retrospective on the uh, cultural impact of Iron Eagle. We're going to have to save that for another day because we've uh, <laughs> we've already kept you too long. But Jerry, I tell you what, what a fan we are, just of uh, of your of your directing, uh, everything you've done from acting to directing, and we're just glad that uh, you're still out there. We, we'd love to uh, stay in contact with you and uh, with your publicist to make sure we can publicize anything that you have coming out, man, because uh, you're you're doing it the right way. We really appreciate all the work you've done. Thanks, guys. I appreciate the time with you. It's been fun. Uh, absolutely. You just hit us up anytime you want to do that Iron Eagle retrospective, and we'll uh, we'll we'll do that. We'll clear out. Drop whatever we're doing. Yeah, we'll, we'll clear. Right there. We'll clear some schedules, and we'll really we'll really delve into that one. You want to talk about some philosophical? Right. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Jerry. Have a great day. We'll we'll be in touch, my man. It's been an honor. All right, all right, you guys. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Thanks.